I've been waiting for this show. Thanks for coming down, Sonia. Thank you. Sonia Blackiston. Yes. And she is uh, the Hawaii Education Manager of Planned Parenthood <coughs> of the Great Northwest and the Hawaiian Islands. Correct. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. This is an important discussion. Absolutely. You know, I know you want to talk about your organization, but I want to talk about the larger issue. Sure. And so let's start with that. <coughs> I was a kid in college. In, 19, in the 1950s, okay, when if, if you had an abortion or your girlfriend had an abortion, it was near the end of your life. Uh, your parents, well, if you were pregnant, if you were pregnant, it was near the end of your life, too. And the abortion was a way to avoid ha having it be the end of your life. It was the only exit because your parents wouldn't tolerate it. It didn't matter what religion. It didn't matter what your cultural background was. If you were a teen pregnant, you were in big trouble. You know, school wouldn't keep you. Your parents wouldn't keep you. You'd be out on the street. It would be terrible. And I was in a middle-class neighborhood. And, and what happened from time to time is uh, young, young couples who were dating. The girl got pregnant. And they decided to have an abortion. And it was illegal in the 1950s. It was a felony. And they go down to the wharfs of Brooklyn. I was in New York. And they would find a woman who would do a job with a coat hanger. Sometimes that worked, sometimes it was the hospital, and sometimes it was worse. Right. And they would pay all the cash they had, hundreds of dollars with a lot of money in those days. And maybe, just maybe, it worked and put them back on a life track again. But it was bloody awful, awful. And I remember uh, how it was the most crushing thing, the most crushing thing that could happen to you if this happened. If you got pregnant and then you had to have an abortion in order to stay alive with your family and school and all that. You weren't around in those days. I was not. But let me tell you how bad it was. So in the, in, in the 70s, a, a ray of light, <clears throat> Roe v. Wade, <clears throat> this changed everything. My generation was already, you know, we were already, you know, in, out of school by 73, but uh, it, it changed everything. And uh, now kids could live again. And they wouldn't have to worry about doing something felonious and, and wrecking their health or their lives. And it was the most important case for that generation. And for my generation, as, uh, you know, recent observers. <clears throat> and there are people who you know, dedicated their lives to helping young teen pregnant people. And I guess one of those organizations, either before or after Roe v. Wade, or maybe both, was Planned Parenthood. Absolutely. Which was a way to save lives yeah. in this country and elsewhere. And in the, in the 70s and later, there was an issue, a public policy issue, a global public policy issue, about trying to contain the world's population. And, that, and that's a pretty good argument uh, for, you know, not for taking all the steps you can to avoid unwanted pregnancies uh, or pregnancies that were, you know, headed for a disaster in one way or another. Um, and I don't know if we think about that much anymore, I mean, about containing the world's population, about uh, avoiding the, uh, the implications of, you know, un, unfettered, Childbirth everywhere. Population. I mean, obvious that sustainability uh, sort of requires that we have a, a contained, um, a contained growth in, in population. I don't think we talk about that much anymore. We talk about the carbon emissions. We talk about climate change. We talk about all these things, but we don't talk about population. I just find this very interesting. Instead, in recent times, as you know, it has become a religious issue. The single most, you know, consuming religion issue in this country, maybe in other places, but in this country, for sure. And it has supplanted government. It has supplanted the law that we all saw happening in 1973. We're so happy about it. Now we have a fight going on in every state, in every place, in Congress, in the Supreme Court. It is bloody 
awful. It is returning to a time which was unenlightened. So you have enlightenment, and now we are going back to unenlightenment. This is, you know, in my life, you know, it just spans all these events. I am so disappointed with this country for changing its mind, essentially, on Roe v. Wade. I mean, it's little by little. I know the case hasn't been overturned, but it certainly has been nipped away. And um, I'm so sad to see that because I don't think it's going to reverse itself. I think we have a trend here. And in this storm, in this, you know, turbulence, is Planned Parenthood. Well, Jay, let me tell you something. I want to allay your fears a little bit because Planned Parenthood is here. We have been here for nearly 100 years and here in Hawaii for nearly 50 and we're not going anywhere. So we are going to be here to provide the care that people need. We're going to be here to provide the education that young people and families need. We're going to be here to provide training and technical assistance to other agencies that need information. And we are going to fight for common sense policies that allow people here in Hawaii and across the nation to have opportunities to make informed decisions about their well-being and health. You're under attack. We are under attack. I mean, they were waiting. We've been under attack. They were waiting. I mean, yes. I told you a story beforehand about people who, you know, uh, support choice, and, and there are people out there waiting to attack them. Uh, really awful. It becomes, um, you know, more than a philosophical argument, it be, more than a, even a religious argument. It becomes an argument of violence and attack and dirty business. I, I don't understand that. So, you know, these guys are waiting for you to make a mistake, do something they could attack, and now you're, you're in that storm. They're going to have to keep waiting, unfortunately, for them, Good. right? Good. So, you know, unfortunately, the attacks on Planned Parenthood are nothing new. We have great people that work for our organization, and we are committed to making sure that we are going to be here to provide the care and information that people need. And so, you know, again, these attacks are nothing new. It distracts from the real work sometimes. Um, we know that the majority of the American people side with Planned Parenthood. A CNN poll recently came out, and seven out of ten people want Congress to put aside this um, mess with the defunding and focus on the real issues. Yeah. So. I mean, it's too bad that you know you have to get funding from an organization which is subject to political attack. You know, it would oh. be better if um, if people gave you money. I mean, ordinary people who believed. And they do. And so, you know, part of me being on the show is um, because of Aloha United Way, and we'd like to thank them for their commitment. Um, we receive funding for our education programs through their impact funding, um, uh, funding stream and under the poverty prevention uh, guise. And so our work in education really helps to educate young people so that they can make informed decisions about their health. Um, when young people are able to make good decisions about their sexual health and prevent teenage pregnancies from happening, waiting longer to engage in sexual activity, they can have better, healthier futures for themselves, which creates better, healthier futures for the families and, and all of and our society. community. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, we've been doing many dozens of shows, uh, you know, for Cindy Adams and uh, Aloha United Way. Of course, this, if you hadn't noticed, this is Aloha United we stand. <clears throat> and certainly Planned Parenthood is standing. Good. We are standing. Um, and, uh, you know, so many of the problems that the social safety network, social safety network is, uh, is dedicated to, to dealing with uh, are connected to teen pregnancies. It is. So many of them. And uh, if we could solve that problem or ameliorate that problem, a lot of the other problems would be ameliorated too, don't you, don't you think? I agree, absolutely. We know that for those that become teen parents, they're more at risk. Um, they may not finish high school. They may have um, less chances of getting into college and therefore having a reduced chance of getting a decent paying job. Um, the children of teen parents are also at higher risk for socioeconomic um, issues. They are more likely to be incarcerated. They're more likely to become a teen parent themselves. They may have um, problems in school. And so really educating people, you know, the youth that we work with are always so thankful that we're there to talk to them. Um, we started doing a lot of work with families and parents, too, who are also equally grateful that we're broaching the subject and teaching them how to have great conversations. It really comes back to honest, open communication. That's yeah. the bottom line. Yeah, well, but it's for a good purpose. I mean, yeah. Forget about the, the global population for a moment, which is still relevant here. Uh, just the, the life, the quality of life of kids who get involved in teen pregnancies. 
and sometimes I'm sure you can, you know, uh, enhance this, but sometimes it's not it's not a couple that's in trouble. It's just the woman. Yeah. Because young lad has sailed off somewhere, and it's just the woman who's left with the problem. True. It, it is unfortunate, and the majority of teen moms do find themselves as single parents. Yeah. And so. a teen mom is an expensive proposition for the state, for you and me, Absolutely. for our taxes, for the federal taxes. Yeah. So we need to do what we can. And I think, I mean, tell me if I'm right or wrong, but most teen moms didn't want to be teen moms. You know, when we look at the data, most teens say that they actually wish they had waited to have sex, yeah. that they actually did not, were not really ready to engage in sexual activity at the point of time that they did. Um, and a lot of times they don't have the information or the education to know how pregnancy happens in the first place or that they could have prevented it by using methods of birth control or even how to simply practice abstinence. They, they're not sure how to communicate to a partner. So what do you do? Let's, let's talk about the, the technique. What we have here is a population which includes a certain number of people. I mean, believe it or not, in the 21st century, <clears throat> the year is 2015. 2015. Okay, and they don't know about sex. Yeah. Nobody told them about sex. It, it gets a big, big surprise, uh, which is incredible. Um, but, it, you know, Hawaii probably has its share of that, maybe more than its share of that. So I guess what you have to do first is find out who they are, try to reach them directly or indirectly, and teach them. Tell me how that works. So our education training program, we work primarily with schools and community-based agencies. And so um, I've been with the program for about almost 12 years now. And in the beginning, schools would contact us and they would say, hey, you, we need to teach about birth control or STIs. And they might have us come in for one or two lessons. This but is before the fact or after the fact? This is, this is when I first started. So I'm going to well, give you a little. Before the fact of pregnancy or after the fact of pregnancy? Um, it can be both. It can be both because we're talking about all different age levels here too, right? And so you will have elementary age youth that need information about puberty and their changing, changing bodies. You'll have middle school youth that still need that same information because telling them in 45 minutes about their body doesn't always stick through two years later when they're in seventh grade. Um, and then introducing them to how to communicate, how to have healthy relationships, whether that is an intimate partner relationship or even just a friendship or even just a family relationship. Um, and then continuing those discussions on in high school, because most teens, most middle school youth are not going to be sexually active, thank goodness, and we really need to continue these discussions through high school. Talking about sexual health education is not a one-time conversation, nor is it simply a job for us as Planned Parenthood. It's got to be a community effort. So we as Planned Parenthood feel that parents are the first and foremost sexuality educators of their youth. We are here as sexual health experts to give factual, medically accurate, age-appropriate information. The media has to do a good job. Um, governments and policies have to be in place for people to have information and access. It's really a community do, effort. Do, do you tell them, I mean, aside from the health aspect of it, do you tell them how it's going to change their life going forward, their average earnings, you know, their, their career possibilities, well, daily we quality of life? We don't need to tell them because they figure it out for themselves. And that's more powerful than me saying, hey, here's the fact. It's more powerful for a young person to get information and for them to connect it and see what their perceived vulnerabilities are or for them to make that connection, wow, this affects me. And if I do A, this could lead to B. But if I do C, then I could have D. Um, so we give them information and sometimes we're going to help them learn the information, but really a lot of times what we see is light bulbs going off in their heads. You said it was an ongoing conversation. Yes. That it's just not one, one time, it's Absolutely. over time. Yes. And uh, a continuing conversation. But it strikes me also that it's not a conversation just with uh, the young lady or the no. young man. It's a conversation with their families. The same family that never told them anything about sex in the first place, that family. And so how do you include the families? You want to take a break before you answer that? No, I'm good. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so I love that question because we've actually started doing a lot of work with families. And starting in 2008, um, we had worked with the Department of Education. We did these four uh, workshop, workshops called I'm Askable. And so the premise of this was we're going to give you some skills and techniques to be an askable parent. Because... As a parent, what do we want? We want our kids to always come to us no matter what, right? We may not agree with what they're doing or what they're saying, but we still want them to come to us, whatever problem that they have. 
And so we started with that. It was wildly successful. And from that, we um, built a full day workshop. We work a lot in conjunction with Hawaii Services Network, and I believe you had Judy on last week. Mm -hmm. um, and so we created some full day workshops, provided training to parents and youth serving providers. And we've started doing mini HOPE workshops. So we'll work with the school and we'll come in for maybe an hour, hour and a half and teach parents about how to communicate effectively with their youth on sexual health. You know what? I just an idea, and we're going to take a break soon. Sure. But if you talk to the parents before the children were old enough to understand any of this, that would help when they had their turn to talk to the children. Oh, sure. Because if they don't know how to talk to their children, it's a problem. You know, this used to come at home. Of course, some parents beat up kids about it, but... <laughs> But at least in the enlightened families, it used to come at home. Yep. And so if you could reach them there. Okay, we're going to take a short break. I love this conversation. This is so important. Listen Thank carefully. You. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Sonia Blackiston from Planned Parenthood, which changed its name to of the great Northwest and Hawaiian Islands. And when we come back, we're going to find out why. <laughs> Aloha. I'm Carlos Juarez, host of Global Connections. And I want to invite you to come join us. We, we cover a range of global issues. We bring a lot of expert opinion. Uh, a lot of issues, whether they're contemporary events happening in the world or maybe looking at things from a more historical perspective. Uh, global issues, very important for us to understand in this globally interconnected world. Join us here on Global Connections. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner and I host Sustainable Hawaii every Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 12 noon. My guests offer insights on challenging economic and environmental issues facing our state and offer innovative solutions to increasing Hawaii's long-term sustainability. Recently, we've been focusing on sustainable land development, food, and energy security. If you have a project or issue you'd like to discuss on the show or would like to be a guest, please contact me at kirstenbturner at gmail.com and tune in live weekly or view the show at your convenience at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. We're talking about Planned Parenthood with Sonia Blackiston. I'm Jay Fidel, and I think this is a very important conversation. Make notes. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sonia, uh, uh, let's see. Oh, oh, yeah. I wanted to suggest to you that if you hit the parents early who may not know anything about a deal with their kids on sex, uh, gosh, it's just flashed in my mind. When I was in college in that same period of time, I had a teacher for phys ed, and he was a retired Marine you know, Marine. Yep. There's no other way to say it. Retired Marine. And on the day, the one day that he was going to talk to these college kids about sex, we were 16, 17, 18 years old. Okay. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of these kids knew nothing. He came in and he had his glasses on. He was wearing a, a coat and tie. He was all dressed up. Mm. It was the only time <laughs> during the whole semester. <laughs> that this guy decided he was going to dress up because this was a serious subject not to be trifled with. He wasn't going to wear his normal teaching clothes. I thought it was so interesting that people, you know, don't treat it as part of life. They treat it as something, something stiff and hard and difficult to deal with. Uh, anyway, uh, so. Well, I mean, what, you what bring are, up a good point. It can be difficult and yeah. it can be awkward and it can be embarrassing. And we let people know that. You know, when we work with parents, we tell them, you don't have to have all the answers. That's fine. It's okay to tell your kids, I don't know. And for the kids, we'll let them know, you know, you might feel really embarrassed to talk to your parents about this, but your parents might also feel the same way, and that's okay. But still try to have that conversation. Right. I'll tell share you. it. Share yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. I had, um, we had, we were doing a program with one of the schools in Ava Beach, and it was a multi-session program, an evidence-based program, which is actually proven to change behavior. And after module two, where we taught them about HIV and AIDS, this one girl comes up and she's like, all right, I'm really freaking out because I think my mom could get HIV. I'm super worried that she's going to get HIV. And we're like, oh, okay, well, what's going on? And she's like, well, my mom has a new husband and they want to have a baby, so they might have unprotected sex. And we're like, Whoa. yeah, that is usually how that might happen, you know, because they want to have a baby. <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> you know, we're like, you're, okay, that's, that's, yes, you're right. That's true. And do you think you could talk to your mom about what you learned? And she's like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, you know, not all adults learn this information. Not everybody gets the information Very that you learned. Very interesting comment. And so you might be able to tell your mom something that she's not even aware of. And so this program that we do, because it's very long, we're, we're in the school for a whole month. So what, it was, every day? 
Yeah, every day for a month. Uh, it's a great program, Making Proud Choices. So, what's again? Making Proud Choices. Okay. And so, it was it was like a Thursday or Friday, and so we weren't going to see her till the next next following week. And so she comes in and she's like, oh, I talked to my mom, and you know what? She didn't know any about that stuff. She didn't know anything. And you know what? We are all going out as a family to get HIV tested. Great. And then at the end of the program, she comes back to us and she's like, you know what? We got our results and we're all negative and we just hug each other all day. And I've told that story a million times, but that is the power of sex education. Good, accurate sex education. It's not just about educating the young person. It's about empowering them to take control over their own lives, to ask questions, to empower them to talk to their families, and look at this ripple effect that yeah, it had. Yeah, and ignorance and fear go together. Yes. If you're ignorant, you're afraid. We got a question on Twitter, I always like that. Uh, this is from our friend Mark Ward. How do you overcome, um, back to politics for a moment, how do you overcome the defamation of Planned Parenthood uh, when the media and politicians perpetuate, allow, nurture misinformation? Um, that, that's a serious question. Yeah, well, you know, we stand by the work that we do. Um, if any of these allegations that Planned Parenthood has been under were true, you know, when, when the crime is committed, people usually go to jail. Obviously, we are still standing. And, you know, we really rely on people out there to be vocal about the fact that, hey, media, you're not portraying this. Here are the facts. And we need people like you out there to be vocal about that. Yeah. I really, um, I think a lot of people in this country, you know, wonder about Congress, <laughs> honestly. I'm sure. I mean, you know, like the Kyoto Protocols about clean air, we, we haven't entered into that. There's so many treaties and agreements that the world has come up with to make a better world that Congress will not adopt. I don't understand that. Anyway, let's put that aside and move back. Uh, I want to I wanna know how big you are. I want to know how big your staff is. I want to know about your connection, and, I, and I'd like you to also explain the name change. Sure. So um, previous, we were Planned Parenthood of Hawaii, and we have now merged this past April with Planned Parenthood of the Great Northwest. And so now we are known as Planned Parenthood of the Great Northwest and the Hawaiian Islands. Can you say that 10 times without taking a breath? I don't know. I haven't practiced that, so <laughs> maybe not right now. Um, but we are the largest geographic affiliate for Planned Parenthood Federation of America. So we serve the whole state of Hawaii, uh, Alaska, western Washington state, and parts of Idaho. And so we're pretty diverse. So you, you merged. Yes, you're we merged. You're a consolidated organization. Yes. Before it was just Planned Parenthood of Hawaii. Yes. So okay. there's many different affiliates for under Planned Parenthood Federation of America across the country. Yeah. yeah. So it's a national organization. Yeah, it's a national and organization. And it has existed since when? Um, we will turn, as a federation, 100 years old next really? year. Yes. I would not have guessed that. Yes. I, you know, I like to sort of take a trip, sort of like my sister-in-law wrote a book about life before Roe v. Wade, because she wanted to remind us, since we forgot already, what it was like sure. uh, to have an unwanted pregnancy uh, in, you know, prior to 1973. It's a very interesting book. I commend it to you. Um, but let's take a trip back 100 years ago. That would have been... 1915. Yes. What was it like to have an unwanted pregnancy in 1915? I don't know. I wasn't around at that time, <laughs> but I can imagine that it would probably have been very difficult. Yeah. Or you didn't really think about it as, in that way. Like you, as a woman, were just going to have a child. Like there wasn't a choice. Well, I guess it largely depended on your family, but I can Absolutely. imagine families, you know, with sort of a Victorian ethic in those days out on the street, never darken our doorstep again, and that'd be the end of your life, you know? I'm sure there's many, many different scenarios. Yeah. Like so this that. was to help people in the nature of the social safety, the yeah. social network, yeah. yeah. Well, interesting, 100 years old. Yeah. And, now, and now, how big are you here in Hawaii? Um, so we currently have two health centers here in Hawaii. We have a Honolulu Health Center on South King. We also have a health center in Kahului, Maui. And I oversee the education team here in Hawaii. So we have a staff of three on Oahu. We have an educator on the island of Kauai, an educator on Maui, and an educator on the west side of Hawaii Island. Okay. So what's an educator? Do he goes to school? Yep. For long periods of time, teaching every day, so, all these classes. Yeah. And the state of Hawaii is good with that. The state of Hawaii, you know, wants you to do that and encourages you, offers you the opportunity, uh, access to the kids. So the Board of Education recently just passed a wonderful new policy, um, Policy 103.5, which provides that 
the Department of Education will ensure, so basically mandate, that all youth will get comprehensive sexuality education, which is great, because before, and this just passed this past June, before that it was very ambiguous. They had an okay policy, but nobody was really sure if they had to teach it. So now this gives clear definition that it must be taught. Must be taught. Yes, it must be taught. But are there, are there layers on that? For example, uh, can, you, can you go in there and say, look, kids, if you are pregnant, you know, one of your options is, guess what, an abortion, and it is legal in the state of Hawaii. As a matter of fact, it was legal way back when, way back when. We were very enlightened back in the 70s. I we remember I, I had friends come from the mainland. Yeah. Uh, they came to Hawaii for the enlightenment. You know. well, we were the first state to legalize abortion. Thank you for that. But getting back to your question about, you know, what we're going to talk to kids about, um, we don't, I mean, if the question comes up, then we will obviously tell them, there are three options that a pregnant woman has, and we will talk about those three options. You know, we're not there to give our own personal values and beliefs about what we think about the issues. We're there in the classroom or at an agency to give medically accurate factual information and let people know that there's a range of beliefs. And, in, and really, if a youth is struggling and they're like, well, I'm not sure, you know, do you think this is okay? It's not my place to tell them what I think is okay or not. I really want to defer them talk this over with your family, see what your family, you know. Here are the considerations. Yeah, we're there in our role as an educator or a trainer to provide medically accurate, age-appropriate information. And when questions come up about things that would have a lot of value-laden um, aspects to it, we're going to defer them to their family. If they don't feel comfortable talking to their family, we really try to have them think about who is that other trusted adult in your life that you can go to. So I want to I want to join Planned Parenthood. I want to be an educator. All right. Okay. Awesome. Do I have to be a doctor, a nurse? Do I have to have social work training? What do I? What credentials do I have to bring to you? Well, we usually like to see people have a bachelor's degree, and um, you know, for me and the staff that we have, passion. You want to have passion. You want to be there for people. You want to be compassionate. You want to, you know, make a difference in the world and evoke change. You know, in our line of work, we don't necessarily see the change right away. You know, we see kids. Sometimes we do a variety of programs too. So. Sometimes we'll see them for a whole month. Sometimes we'll see a kid for one or two lessons. It depends on what the need is or the request is from the school or the agency. Um, but it's great when you do hear stories about how you've been able to affect people. So for instance, we had um, a teacher that we had worked at the school with, and we had actually taught her daughter unknowingly at a different school. And she had come up to us one day and said, you know, my daughter's in college, and um, she's in a relationship, and she ended up going to Planned Parenthood to get her birth control. And, you know, the mom admitted, she's like, I never talked to her about that. And so I asked her, how did you know about that? And she's like, well, Mom, Planned Parenthood came to my health class in, like, 10th grade. So, uh, you know, even from that one class talking about birth control and just saying, here, here are some resources for you. Please, you know, take resources if you want to. We were able to make an impact on that on that student's life many years later. Yeah, well, so that's the, pretty gratifying. the kids are impressionable for sure. Yeah. I want to talk about this from the kid's point of view in sure. a minute. I want to make myself a kid. We're all kids. We're you all know. kids, yeah. Uh, this is Think Tech Hawaii. We're uh, doing uh, uh, Aloha United We Stand with uh, Sonia Blackiston. She's the Hawaii Exchange Manager, Planned Parenthood of the Great Northwest and the Hawaiian Islands. We're going to take a short break, and we're going to talk about what it, what, it's, what it feels like to be a kid again, yes, in school. <laughs> Aloha, my name is Roy Kodani, and every Wednesday at 1 p.m., I host Life in the Law, which is a segment of Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, basically, I host guests who have some relevancy to law in Hawaii. And uh, I hope you will continue to tune in. If you have questions, tweet us at Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Aloha! How you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Okay, here we are in school. We're kids. Okay. That's Sonia Blackiston. She's the Hawaii Education Manager of Planned Parenthood here. This is Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. I've always been a kid and I'm not changing. I don't care what you say. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm a kid. How old am I when I first get exposed to Planned Parenthood? 
Well, I guess it depends on your family and if they talk about Planned Parenthood from an early age. Um, but, you know, the reality is we tend to see students um, usually around the fifth grade level and we start talking about anatomy and puberty. Um, sometimes we even see them earlier. Some of our work, um, our educators do do work on um, sexual abuse prevention and so they'll talk about, um, you know, safe touch, not safe touch, and those can even be done in preschool. Um, unfortunately, you know, sexual abuse is unfortunately prevalent in our society and yeah. you know it's important that even at a young age children know that their bodies are their own and that they have the right to say no yeah that's so important yeah and to know the signals when it's not right yeah, to be able to go yeah. to an adult and yeah. use proper language you know using proper language is so yeah. important yeah. yeah yeah you know it's, it's too bad we have that in our world but that's yeah. what we have in our world yeah. okay so if, if I'm in uh, what did you say fifth grade mm -hmm. I'm what 10 or 11 I'm probably not puberty yet probably not probably not and some some maybe some maybe but it depends but yeah i'm probably the, the great majority I'm not not puberty so what does this mean to me i mean i i um you know i still don't i still hate girls i hate girls <laughs> <laughs> you may just like girls <laughs> So, you know, we kind of... I put their ponytail in the inkwell. Oh, right? no. <laughs> We're going to talk to you about respecting others then and, and how do you have, you know, good communication and, and feel respected and, and share love. Um, so at fifth grade, you know, usually we come in and, and the teachers want us to just talk about anatomy and puberty. So we'll go over the basic function functions of the body and talk about, you know, these are changes that you're going to be going through. These and kids do not know about that, right? Some of them know. I mean, some of them are going to come from families where this discussion has happened well, or they've seen... When I was seen... a kid, my parents gave me a book. Oh, okay. It was okay. probably around that time. And, and the, it was a very primitive book. And, and the name of the book was The Stork Oh. Did Not Bring You. Oh, okay, that's good. I was worried you were going to say the stork brought you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Well, you know, that's funny because there's actually a great book out there called It's Not the Stork. And it's a wonderful book, and I've used it even with my own daughter, um, who is now six. And um, it's great for preschool age children to help talk to them about, you know, what is a common question a three to five year old asks? Well, where do babies come from? Yeah. It's important to give them the correct information, you know, yeah. an age appropriate information. There, we have a colleague of ours who. Um, as a young girl, she was told that you got pregnant from eating watermelon seeds. Well, do you know how terrified she was? She never <laughs> ate watermelon for years and years. So, it's so cruel to tell a kid it something is. like that. Yeah. Because they're impressionable and they carry that for years and years. She, <laughs> she probably still has a problem with watermelon. A little bit, <laughs> yes, which is too bad. It's delicious fruit. So. Anyway, okay, yeah. so, all right, so I'm, I'm going to learn a little about it when, before I can fully appreciate it. Okay. Um, now, this goes on. This is, this is a continuing conversation. Yes. Okay, now I'm, now I'm in puberty. Um, does, this, does the discussion change because I'm older and there's a better chance that I will, A, understand it, and B, you know, be self-aware about sex, or, and or C, actually be you know active in sex at what age i don't know what happens this this time but you know 13 maybe 12 13 14 you know we hope uh, it doesn't happen that age the the average age is around around 17 years old mm -hmm. that's about the average age um we know from some data from hawaii uh the youth risk behavior survey that um there are that about 10 percent of middle school youth report being sexually active which you know quite honestly is probably 10 percent too much yeah. um, we also want to recognize that if students are filling out these tests too, that maybe they were sexually active, but not by choice. You know, as we talked about, sexual abuse unfortunately is in our society. I um, mean, those are things that we want to be mindful of. Yeah. Um, you know, it's important that we talk to youth, meet them where they're at, um, be aware that there could be um, situations that could trigger trauma, especially we're talking about sexual health. Um, go home with them. I'm sorry. Do you go home with them? No. You don't go to the. You don't go home. Oh no, we don't do home visits. Yeah. Do the parents ever come in and meet you at the school? Um, when we do parent workshops, that's what we'll do. We'll have we'll parents come to the school usually and um, do a workshop with them. And the child will be there? Uh, the workshops that we currently do here in Hawaii, no, we don't have it set up that way. But um, I think that's the best way. That And that's one of the benefits of this merger is that our colleagues in Washington and the rest of our affiliate, they do do programs like that. So we're looking to learn how they do that mm, and bring that over here right, as well. Because that can be really beneficial. Sophisticated thing yeah. to have them all together when, uh, when the information first comes out yeah. for the parents. <laughs> well, you know, you might separate them and do groups and then bring them back together. Uh, There's all yeah, different ways to yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, now now I am for sure sexually active. Okay. The boys want me. They don't hate me anymore, and I don't hate them. Okay. And uh, you know, I feel those those urgings, and uh, I want to have sex. Um, I'm in your I'm in your your education program. Okay. What's the conversation like then? We're going to talk to them at the high school level. We're going to talk to them about again still anatomy because they still need to understand how their body works. We'll talk to them about you know ways to prevent sexually transmitted infections, um, birth control methods. We'll talk to them about abstinence, how it could be, how to actually practice it. A lot of kids are like, I'm going to be abstinent, but they have no idea what that looks like, right? And so they have to, to be able to define it, communicate about it in order to be able to practice it. Yeah. Um, we help them think about, you know, what do I want from a relationship? What does love and trust and respect and caring look like? And how do I show that to a partner? And so... A partner who I am considering sex with or I'm having sex with. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to build a real relationship instead of just a, a user relationship. Yeah. Or maybe that maybe letting them know that you don't even need to have sex to be in a relationship. Yeah. I mean, you can have a relationship with someone and it doesn't have to be sexual. Yeah. You know, really. Um, we Harry really encourage Sally. them. Harry met Sally. <laughs> <laughs> we encourage them. If you can't talk about sex, you're not ready to have sex. And, you know, we're talking a lot about youth here, but I think we could probably say that goes to some adults as well. Yeah, okay. All right, now it gets, uh, so, oh, so you're going to talk to me about, um, what do you call it, um, uh, pills? Birth, all different methods birth of birth control. Birth control methods. Yep. So you're going to give me the whole array. Yep. And did I hear you say before that you would actually give me the pills? No, 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 no. They would need to go to a health center to get that. Health center. Yes. Okay, what health center? So here I am, young girl. I, I like the option of, uh, of uh, birth control pills. Okay. Um, what do you say to me? What do I do? We'll say, there are resources. Check out our website. Um, we usually bring in pamphlets that list a lot of different places. You know, sometimes Planned Parenthood may not be the closest place for them to get to. There are other community health centers that do offer these services. For free? And so, yep, for free. free. Yep. Does that mean I have to be underprivileged to get the pills? No, as we, you know, Planned Parenthood and other community health centers here in the state participate in the Title X federal program, which provides um, low income uh, and basically free to low cost uh, birth control methods. That must be under attack in, in Washington, too, eh? A little bit, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Silly. I mean, the attack is pervasive, my God. Um, okay, so, so that's one possibility. What are yep. the other possibilities? Abstinence? Abstinence. Pills? What else? You know, not well, not just pills. There's a whole range of birth control methods out there. Okay. So there's like highly effective ones called um, LARCs, which are long-acting reversible contraception. Um, there, of course, is a pill. Condoms. We have the lowest rate of condoms. condom use in the entire nation. Why is that? Is amongst that, is that our a bad kids. thing? Yeah. It is a bad thing. Yeah. Because we actually have lower rates of youth here in Hawaii that say that they're sexually active, but of the youth that are sexually active, they're having unprotected sex. They're not protecting themselves, and therefore we're ninth in the country so for teen pregnancy. It's just ignorance or what? Um, it's probably lack of education. It's probably lack of access. It can be a lot of contributing factors. Yeah, yeah. interesting. So they had to go to the health center for that too? Yeah. Well, no. Condoms you can access. Um, so community health centers might have them for free. You can purchase them in stores. Sometimes costs can be a barrier for young people. Um, but condoms are pretty much available out there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's very important. And very okay, important. so you were able to change the percentage of kids who actually use condoms. Then we would like to hope that through our work, we are going to educate young people and hope that they do choose to use condoms to protect themselves. How about the morning after pill? Is that around? It is around, and it's over the counter now, yeah. so it's accessible. Although price can be an issue because it ranges about fifty dollars. Wow. Yeah. But it's it's it works. It works. It has a, a roughly about uh, I would say an eighty-nine to ninety-five percent uh, um, chance of effectiveness. Worth, worth trying. And you know, there's different types out there. Some can be more effective for the longer period because it, it's good for up to five days, right? So. Um, some of them, depending on the formulary, can be more effective throughout those five days. Some of them, it's a timing thing. You do need to take it as soon as possible. Okay, so uh, that, and that's one of the things you discuss with the kids, too? Yep. And um, they, they would then go out and find a way through the health center or the pharmacy or whatever to yeah. actually get the pills. Yeah. The pills. As but educators, we don't give any sort of... Options. We're giving them information. Yeah. That's our goal. Okay. Yeah. Now, now we get to the, you know, the problem. A uh, kid comes to you. You know, you can't stop this. And a kid's been listening to your education, and he says, uh, or she says, or maybe he, I mean, you know, he, he'd be concerned about his girlfriend. Sure. Uh, comes to you and says, Sonia, you know, my girlfriend is pregnant. What do I do? Give me some advice. 
Uh, you're not going to just say, well, here are your options, one, two, three, four, five. I you mean, know, there's only two options at that point, assuming you're more than five days after conception. There's well, there's three options. Okay, go ahead. So the three options are to parent, to choose adoption, or to choose abortion. So there's always three options adoption. out there. Adoption, okay, yeah. I hadn't thought of that, yeah. Yeah. Do you help kids with that? Um, you know, it's rare that a student will come up to us after class and ask that, but if they did, we would basically say, here are your options. You know, I can't tell you what you should do. You need to really think about that for yourself. It was, if it was a male student to come up, I would say this is a discussion that, you know, you need to have with your girlfriend, and it's ultimately her decision on what she decides. Yeah. Interesting moment, but, though. Yeah. And give I'm them sure information. I'm sure this happens, doesn't it? They and, do come up to you, don't they? You know, I have to say that I may have had that happen, like, once. Really? Yeah. Why? They, is it that they don't see you in that role? Is it that they're afraid to talk to anybody at all we, about it? Well, we may not be at the school long enough. Mm. You know, sometimes when we're at the schools, we see three, four, five, six classes a day. Um, if we're in there for two sessions, you know, we might not have the rapport with them to feel comfortable. But we're giving them the information so that if they have that question in their mind, they have resources of where to go to. And we're always encouraging them to talk to their family. Okay, moving on to a couple of other categories. What about a, a rape victim? who feels, you know, that she might have conceived. Um, do you talk to her? We would definitely get her information on where to get access and help from. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And what about a, I don't know, a, a homeless or a dis economically disadvantaged single mother who is now also pregnant or possibly about to get pregnant? She's got kids now, there's more kids coming, and she still has the same income or lack of income. Uh, do you talk to her? If she is in the audience, we're talking to them as a group usually. We don't, our educators really don't do one-on-one -on -one consultation. Um, so if she's a member of a group that we're working with, we would give her the same information that we would give other people. Yeah. If she's looking for particular services, then we would do our best to get her the referrals and information that yeah, she needs. Do you have contact with the homeless as a group? Um, yeah, some of our, especially on, our, on the Big Island, um, she's been doing a lot of work with the homeless population. Yeah. So is a why, why ahead or behind of the curve on this? I mean, do we have more unwanted, un, unresolved pregnancies, uh, uncharacterized, call it, pregnancies than, than other places or less? I mean, are we in control or are we out of control? We have a lot of work to do. So we're currently ranked ninth in the nation for teen pregnancies. Yeah. And so teen pregnancies would be teens between the ages of 15 to 19. Yeah. And we generally tend to see the um, higher numbers in the 18 to 19 year olds. So yeah. those that are right about that, you know, right, right out of high school age. Um, so there's a lot of work that we need to do. Okay, there's the people camera, that one over there. In fact, you can see a photograph of some people under the camera. Yes. So I'd like you to take a minute to close the show by sure. talking to them and telling them what message you would like to leave with them today. All right. Well, Planned Parenthood has been here for nearly 100 years and here in Hawaii for nearly 50. And with the support of great agencies like Aloha United Way and our donors here on Oahu and across the state, we are still going to be here to provide um, the compassionate, affordable, high-quality uh, health care to patients. We're going to be here to give uh, young people and their families information, empower them. We're going to provide training and technical assistance to uh, schools and partner agencies. And we're going to continue to fight for common sense policies that allow people here in Hawaii the opportunity to make informed decisions about their health and well-being. So we invite you to join us, check out our services, um, volunteer, donate, check us out at ppgnhi.org. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sonia Blackiston. Great to be here. Wonderful. Mahalo. Wonderful to have you. Thanks. Hello.